Acts chapter 27. We're going to read starting in verse 1 and we're going to read through 28 verse 16. So a large portion of text, uh, but I trust that the reading of it will be profitable uh, to you. So this is the word of God. And remembering that Paul is making an appeal uh, to go before Caesar uh, to defend himself against the false accusations that had been leveled. So starting in verse 1, And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidius. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salome. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind, called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on they took a sounding again and they found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. 
And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they were all encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who, would sw- who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. So, and so it was that all were brought safely to land. After we were brought safely through, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all, because it had begun to rain and it was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Though he has escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw no misfortune come to him, They changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius. He received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed. And putting his hands on him, healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. They also honored us greatly. And when we were about to sail, they put on board whatever we needed. After three months, we set sail on a ship that had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria, with the twin gods as a figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days, and from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. After one day, a south wind sprang up, and on a second day, we came to Petuli. There we found brothers and were invited to stay with them for seven days, and so we came to Rome. And the brothers there, when they heard about us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. Again, this is the word of God. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, um, but as we are now approaching the end of the book of Acts, I can't hardly believe that we have been in it for over a year. And so bearing that in mind, I thought it might be helpful for us to go back to the beginning to remember what it is that we are reading here. Uh, the first sermon that I preached on the book of Acts was on April 5th of last year. And it was on chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And in those verses, Luke, who is the, chap, uh, the author of the book of Acts and the author of the gospel of Luke, uh, is, he's writing to a man named Theophilus and providing him with an introduction to this book. And he writes this, In the first book, O Theophilus, and this is speaking of the gospel of Luke, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And my my point in this message was that the gospel of Luke, Luke said here, was all about what Jesus began to do and teach. And that the implication was that the book of Acts was going to be a record of what Jesus continued to do and teach. The continuing work of Christ in and through his people. And I took us to a number of different passages, including Acts chapter 2, verse 33, that demonstrates that fact. What we're reading on the pages of the book of Acts is the risen Christ 
working through his spirit to encourage, to equip, and to move his people out on mission for the kingdom. To what end? What was his goal? Well, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Paul tells the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so when we look at the book of Acts, what we are doing is we're reading the story about what Jesus did through his people to get the gospel out to the ends of the earth. And that brings us to today's story as Acts is coming to a close. Paul is headed to Rome. And in some ways, Rome may even be called the ends of the earth. But Rome was the center of the political world in Paul's day. It was the hub, if you will. If you wanted to reach the ends of the earth, you had to start by going to Rome. It's like us, if we decided that the Lord was calling us to go to Nepal or to go to China, we're not going to drive down to Fayetteville and try to catch a plane at that little Fayetteville airport in order to get to China. We have to go to a hub. We need to go to Raleigh or maybe even up to Washington, D.C. to catch an international flight that can get us to go to where we want to go. The same is here for Paul, that if he wants to reach the ends of the earth, if Christ is going to use him to reach the ends of the earth, Rome is the first connecting flight, if you will. This is where it begins. And that's where all of this backstory is relevant to today's passage. If what we are reading is Jesus moving his messengers along a path of his making, if Jesus's aim is is to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. And if Paul is the messenger specifically chosen by Christ to accomplish this task, then it begs the question, why did Jesus take Paul out into a storm on the sea? This makes me think of a number of things. Well, I mean, one is the terror that on a human level, Paul must have felt. You know, this, this story takes on a very ominous note when you consider what it was like to be seafaring in those days and how the Jews, in, particularly, in particular, really had no love of the sea. The sea was seen to be very dark it was considered to be very perilous. It was used as a symbol to describe everything that was sinister, um, threatening. It was a symbol for chaos. Um, and this was stand in contrast to, say, a river or a stream. A river or a stream was seen as being a provision of life and refreshment in an arid country. But the ocean was a wholly different thing. It was dark and foreboding. And that's why we believe that when we read in Revelation 2.11 of the new heavens and new earth, we read this. John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I don't know if that's ever struck you, if you've ever read that passage and found that to be kind of curious. In a new heavens and a new earth, John says, there was no longer any sea. Why? Because the sea is the place of chaos. The sea is the place of darkness and foreboding. The sea is a place of fear. But what is in the new heavens and the new earth? There is the river of the water of life. So here's Paul, and mission-wise, he has to be excited to be headed to Rome. He's on a journey to accomplish that for which he has been called. But humanly speaking, he could not have been excited about this trip. I mean, for one, um, he is a prisoner. 
right? He's getting on the ship as a prisoner. And not only was he a prisoner, he's now a prisoner being placed upon a ship. And not only was he being placed on a ship to go on to a journey out to sea, but he was going at the worst time possible. The ancient writer Phagesius wrote, quote, Up to September the 14th, sailing was safe in the Mediterranean. Then from September the 14th to November the 11th, it was dangerous. After November 11th, sailing was impossible. Now look at Acts 27, verse 9. What's it say? Luke writes, Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. The fast that Luke is referencing is the Jewish Day of Atonement. And the Jewish Day of Atonement took place in the beginning of October. So the Vegesius has said that any time after September 14th, sailing on the sea was dangerous. Well, here they are, mid-October at the earliest, at the time of danger. Perhaps they're even knocking on the door of the time of impossibility when it comes to sailing. And we, of course, have seen in the text the results. The ship is just torn to shreds as they try to make their way there. Paul had to have struggled in this time, humanly speaking. I mean, can you imagine what it must have been like to be in his shoes and to wonder, Christ, I'm following your lead. I know Rome is the place that makes most sense for me to go to accomplish the task you've put before me. But now, in these conditions, do you not think that there had to have been the question, what did, what did I do wrong? Where did I make a misstep? God, are you still there? Christ, are you still with me? That you would send me out like this? Why did Jesus take Paul out into the storm? It makes me uh, think back when I was in seminary and I was in my first sermon writing class and we were working on the practice of, of trying to discover what is the main meaning of a particular text. And we did that by trying to discern what is the question that this passage is seeking to answer. That's how we framed what we were doing. And so the professor read for us Matthew 18, uh, Matthew 8, verses 18 through 27, which is the story of Jesus giving orders to the disciples that they are to go from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other. And Jesus gets in the boat, and the disciples fall into the boat after him. And the next thing you read is this, quote, And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he, meaning Jesus, was asleep. They went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And then the professor turned to us, the class, and said, or asked, What question is this passage answering? What would have been your answer to that? What question was that passage answering? So the professor said the question that passage is answering is, why did Jesus take the disciples out onto the Sea of Galilee? And what is the answer to that question? Was it not to test their faith in the middle of the storm? Was it not to show them, as they put it, what sort of man is this? 
that even the winds and the sea obey him. Could it not be the same for Paul? I mean, certainly there's so many things that are going on in this story. There's so many things that God is doing in this. But at the center of all the purposes that are being worked out, God is calling to Paul in the midst of the storm. Why are are you afraid? Are you of little faith? Who do you say that I am? In what or in whom do you trust? And is that not the same for us? Is that not the same in the storms that we go through in life? Are not the same questions being asked? Paul will admit this is true. He says in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9, he writes, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely Not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Could that not be the same for you? In the storms that you have faced, or in the storms that you are facing now. Undoubtedly, again, God is doing all kinds of things in our lives that maybe at this moment we don't have the eyes to see, and maybe we won't see for years to come. But in the center of it all, is he not asking these same questions of you? And of course, now to frame it this way is to assume that there's an intentionality in the storm. There is a purpose in the clouds and in the waves and in the rain. They are not accidental. They are not here by chance. It isn't that God has been caught off guard and now he's in the position of trying to redeem things and clean them up for you. It's to say that Jesus knew the storm was coming. Or even that Jesus himself brought the storm about and then sent Paul out into the midst of it purposely. The ultimate purpose being worked out, not in spite of the storm, but through the storm. Paul thought getting on that ship ship was merely the means to be transported to the city of Rome, albeit with poor timing. But Jesus put him on that ship undoubtedly for many other reasons. And we know that because the ship never makes it to Rome. That ship doesn't make it to Rome. So Paul was not put on that ship to get to Rome on that ship. He was there for other reasons. This brings to mind another story. Um, You remember the tsunami that occurred back in 2005? Um, It was horrific. I mean, I, I remember well seeing the pictures on the front pages of the newspapers of, of the bodies floating on the water and just turning my eyes away because I I didn't want to see them. It was so shocking of an event that NPR, National Public Radio, did a series of broadcasts in which they asked representatives from different faith traditions to come and try to make sense of it all. They asked, I think there was a Buddhist, there was a uh, a Jewish rabbi, I'm not sure all who was there, but each one saying, how do you make sense of something as horrific as this? Well, the person that they chose to speak from a Christian perspective was John Piper, and many of you know him. Um, But I'll never forget listening to his answer the first time And asking God to give me as much wisdom as he did in answering the questions that were being thrown at him. 
while acknowledging the horror of what t- took place, he did not back away from the assertion of God's control, of God's sovereignty over all things, and the implications of that for the believer in Christ. He said, and he's referencing the Matthew 8 passage of Jesus taking the disciples into the boat. He said this, When the wave rose, he rebuked it, and it stopped. And then Piper turns to the tsunami and says, So whether Satan or nature started it, Jesus standing on the water could have said, Thus far and no further. And he didn't. And since I don't believe that Jesus does anything whimsically, I believe, therefore, there is design in it. And I look for design. And I remember hearing that and saying, Amen. And that's what we do when we come to this passage in, in, in Acts 27. What is the design in this? What is it that Christ is seeking to accomplish in this and through this? Was it not to have Paul declare in verse 25, Take heart, men. I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. Was it not for Paul to be strengthened in and take a bold stand because of his faith of God and to encourage others to do the same, including you and me? Paul had seen Jesus work in amazing ways. Paul, Jesus has already come to Paul and revealed himself a couple times in the book of Acts, which just simply tells us, it shows us how difficult of a journey Paul has been on, that Jesus has to come and, and comfort and assure him. We've just read where Paul has written that he despaired even of life itself because of the difficulties that he faced. And so it stands to reason that when Paul's thinking about going before Caesar, although Paul is the one who made the appeal to do it, this, he knew that this was going to be a trying time. I mean, in Roman society, Caesar was seen as being divine. He was, he was a god in their eyes, and, and Paul was going to have to stand before him. So what did Paul need to know most right now as he goes? He needed to be reminded that no matter how hard things get, no matter how difficult things are, Christ is with him, and he will be with him. And Paul will not suffer any harm until Christ's purposes for him are accomplished. The storm was intended to ask Paul, Paul, do you believe this? And what is it said that he believed? Verse 23. Paul tells them, this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Could the storm that you are facing in your life right now be the same call to you? In whom do you have faith? Do you believe the words of God to you? Do you believe, God asks, that I will accomplish my purposes through you no matter how hard the storm rages? And you may say, well, that's easy for Paul. I mean, Paul and an angel appear before him. Come on. But what we have is even better. We have the scriptures inspired by the Holy Spirit. And we've been given eyes to see by the work of the Holy Spirit in us, to understand them. We've got the work of the Holy Spirit within in our ears to hear them and his work in our heart that we might believe them. And we may ask, is that really better? Well, yes, it's, uh, it's better. I mean, you just think on a, on a pragmatic level, are you telling me that if an angel were to show up in your room tonight and say, listen, don't, don't be afraid, take heart, that the first thing that you wouldn't do is check your medications? 
He'd say, oh man, I must have COVID. What in the world is that all about? You won't believe this crazy dream I had last night. That's exactly what we would do. But God has given us the unshakable, absolute, foundational truth. And he's given us the hearts to believe it. And Peter, Peter makes this point. In 2 Peter, he says, hey, we were witnesses to all this, but you've got something better. You've got the assured prophetic word of God. And again, it strikes us as kind of strange. How can that better than actually be better? How can that actually be better than being there? Well, I mean, come on. If we read the Gospels, what do we see? The disciples are walking with Jesus, but... Most of the time, they are confused. They're like trying to figure these things out. Ronnie pointed this out in Sunday school this morning. Well, I don't remember what, what passage it was that you honed in. And I was like, oh, remember that because I wanted to go back to it. But um, the, the whole idea, they're, they're, they're looking at Christ doing what he's doing and saying, how can this be? Christ saying that he's going to be crucified. And them going, no way, Jesus. No way is that going to happen. And then he's crucified. And afterwards, they're in distress because they, what now? The one we put all our trust in, he's gone. What now? But we live on this side of the crucifixion and the resurrection. All the promises that had been made um, to us through the word were no longer in suspense wanting to see, are they actually going to be fulfilled? We know that they have been fulfilled. We know that every word of God is something that we can hold on to and grasp onto and say, we have the assurance of knowing this is the truth. So Peter says, hey, man, this is much better. This, this is much better than actually having been there. And so we've got this. And what, what do we read in this? What do we see in the word? There are so many places we could go. Isaiah 43, 1 through 2. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And it makes me wonder if Paul had that verse in mind when he was talking to the sailors. Psalm 125, 2. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. Psalm 107, 23 through 29, which we sang. Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down into the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and they staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them in their, or from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. And again, there are so many more passages we could go to, but, but for me, the pinnacle, the peak of passages that I have gone to time and time again for my own personal comfort, and which I've shared to many people in their dark storms, is Romans 8, 28. We know, we don't guess, we don't wonder. We know that for those who love God, all things, all things, not some things, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. There's so many things that we could say about this passage, but I can't help but quote once again from Piper during this interview. Because he said some things that, I, again, I thought, Lord, help me again to be as wise as he has been and how he's responding to this, this interviewer who's not a believer, who's asking these questions out of, a, you know, how do you make sense of this? And I remember at one point she, she let out a little chuckle and said, I am so glad that we have you here answering these questions. And I was so glad, too, that they didn't have Joel Osteen or somebody in there, some other nonsense doing this. So here's what he said. They talked about suffering. How, how, what do you say, he, they ask? What do you say when they face their own personal tsunamis, right? He says this. 
The people who come to me, they want something solid. They don't want mush. They don't want poetry. They don't want me to say, oh, there is a lot of mystery in the world and we don't have a clue about what's going on. They say, tell me a promise from the Bible I can stand on. And I, he says, depending on where they are, you know, we recognize that we may not say anything. If it's fresh, then we may just weep. That's all we do is, is we weep. And I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit here, but he, he says, he talked about a family in his church that had lost a child. And he said, you know, when I went and visited them, we just hugged for an hour and wept. And that's what you do. You just, you're just present with them. You don't say anything. But then he, then he says this. Sooner or later, they're going to say, after the hug and after the tenderness, okay, that was good. You want to do some theology with me here, please? I need to understand what God is up to. And I will say the biblical promise is that all things work together for good for those who love God. And I say God has a purpose in this, and it is good. And then he said, I have heard that called banal, cheap, and blasphemous in the press in the last week, such that my heart breaks. I remember he's responding after the tsunami. He says, I have a double broken heart, one for all the people who were swept away and for those who were left behind, and one for those who are mocking the very truth that sustains my people. I tell them Christ has walked through it before you. He is with you. He is in control. Nothing happens by accident. The very God that was governing your life when this happened has the power to govern your life in the future. If you strip God of his sovereignty, his absolute control of the world in calamity, you do not have a sovereign God to offer people on the other side of calamity, which is their only hope for being able to survive the awful future that has been opened up to them. Jesus comes in through and after calamity and says, I'm here. I offer my help. It is sovereign. It is good. It is wise. It is loving. So then he says, I don't want to rescue God from his sovereignty by saying, well, he really didn't have anything to do with that. Because if I do that, the one thing that is going to help an 18-year-old adjust to thyroid cancer or the dad adjust to the tumor they just found in his 10-year-old, I've taken it away from them if I say, well, he's not really in control here. God is in control. And he's in control of the storms that are in your life. And the question in the midst of the storm is, do you believe it? So too often we doubt God's word and we trust our feelings. We become the ultimate judge. We were trying to size up our situation and we may deny that that's, that's what we do until we're really pressed and tested. We see this all through scripture where those who have come before us have done this. In Genesis 12, I have Paul calls to Abram and he says, go to the land that I'll show you. And he does. He packs up and he heads off and we're very impressed with his faith as we should be. But then we get to Genesis 17 and we see holes in his faith that maybe he was not even aware that were there. Because God says to Abraham, as for you and your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations, and kings of peoples will come from her. And how did Abraham respond? He said, amen, I, I believe you, God. No, that's not at all what he did. It says, Abraham fell on his face and he laughed. Why did he laugh? Because of his and Sarah's age, it seemed impossible. Abraham asked, shall a, shall a child be born to a man when he's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, at 90 years old, bear a child? A little while later, the Lord appeared to him again. And he said, I surely will return to you this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah overheard the conversation. And she laughed out loud. Saying, after I'm worn out, my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? And she puts it. 
And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a son now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? And what happened? Chapter 21. The Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised, and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time of which God had spoken to him. God showed himself true to his word in the midst of a situation that to human eyes seemed absolutely impossible. And the same is true for you. God works all things, not again, not some things, all things together for good. And this includes your storm. And that is the promise of God to you. And what is your response? Is it to laugh? It may be a laugh of despair, but sometimes we find ourselves laughing at such things. Why? Is God not able to use your storm for good, for your good? Maybe you assume that the storm has some other ends altogether. That maybe the storm is in the, an indication that God doesn't have your good in mind at all. That maybe God has abandoned you, that he simply doesn't care. But no, and notice in this story, I mean, what, what it looks like when you're looking at situations throughout the eyes, through something other than the eyes of faith, other than the eyes of trust in God. Here's Paul in the storm. The ship has been torn apart. They land on this, this island, Malta. And, and just when you think the danger's passed, shoo, we made it through that storm. I don't know how we made that. Well, God saw us through. What happens? They build a fire and Paul picks up some sticks and throwing a fire and a snake comes out and bites his hand. And the eyes that do not have faith are watching the scene. And what do they conclude? Well, obviously, Paul is a murderer. Paul has done something really bad. And God intended to do him in on the storm, but somehow he made it through the storm. But God's not going to let him go any further than this because he sent a snake to bite him. Because whenever there's storms in life, whenever there's tragedy in life, obviously that means that God does not care. Obviously that means that God is against you. Obviously means that God's justice needs to fall down upon your head. Was any of this true? No, none of that was true. This says echoes of Job, doesn't it? <laughs> Job and his friends. Job loses everything. And his friends come along to encourage him with quotation marks around the word encourage. And what do they say to Job? Job, obviously you've done something wrong. Job says, I don't know what I've done. Well, obviously you've done something wrong. Look at your life. It's a disaster. You better get right with God. Well, if I knew what to get right with God over, then I would do it. So he cries out to God, God, if there's some place that I need to get right with you, show me what it is. Because I can't make heads or tails. I can't make any sense of what's going on in my life right now. And I got these guys over here telling me that I, I'm in sin or I've done something. So what is it, God? What is it? But what does Job hear at the end? God said, it had nothing to do with something that you've done that was wrong, Job. In fact, God looks at his friends who have been telling Job, you better make this right, Job. And he says to them, my anger burns against you, his friends, and against your two friends. He's speaking to one of them. And against your two friends, for you have not spoken about me what is right. You've not spoken about me what's right. When you've sized up the situation the way that you have, that's not the way I operate. And so what's your assessment? of the situation that you are in? What's your assessment of the storms that you've gone through in your lives? Are you speaking rightly of God when you're thinking through those things and the conclusions that you're coming to? Do you conclude based on your experience that God is not in control? Do you conclude based on your experience that God does not care? None of those are true. Jesus answers both of those charges in one simple, simple illustration from Matthew 10, 29. He says, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs on your head are all numbered. 
Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. And in that one little illustration, Jesus says God is in control of every situation, every little detail that goes on in this world, even the falling of a sparrow off a tree to the ground. And God is so aware of you that he knows the number of heads that are on your head. And you are of so much more value than those birds. The point is, being that God is in control of every little detail of your lives and he has your good in mind. And so when it comes to facts and feelings, we've got to keep those in the right order. Facts come first. What are the facts that I have from the word? Let my feelings follow those facts. Don't let my feelings follow my interpretation of the events going on around me. What does God's word say? Do I trust it? Why do the storms then rattle us so much? Because we've forgotten. We've forgotten our story. We've forgotten that we are children of God, that our identity is not in whether we made or did not make the team or whether we did or did not get the promotion or even get the job. We've forgotten that our value is not found in what our fellow students or co-workers or bosses or family or spouse think of you. It's not uh, that our value is found in whether that person that you've had an eye on has agreed to go on a date with you or not. We've forgotten that our security is not found in our job, in our finances, or in our degrees. We've forgotten that our lives are but a vapor, and there's really nothing new under the sun, and that there's no amount of possessions that will ever satisfy your heart and soul. We've forgotten that the world is not our home, but instead that we are strangers and aliens here, longing in our hearts for a better country. We've forgotten that suffering here is light and momentary compared to the eternal weight of glory that will be ours in the new heavens and the new earth. And we've forgotten that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when you have forgotten all of those things, even if it's just for a moment, it seems impossible for God to do good in the midst of the storm. But when you remember those things... Then you can see differently. Then you see through the eyes of faith. And then you recognize the good that God brings out of it. And we recognize that the ultimate good that God is doing in whatever storm it is we're facing is he's bringing us into conformity to Christ. That's his goal. So Hebrews 5, 8 through 9 says this of Christ. Quote, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus' life of suffering is what made Jesus who he was, as the man of sorrows, the man of compassion, the man of mercy, and the man of grace. And so, in our own lives... When neither sun nor stars appear for many days as it did upon that ship, those are no less a part of God's gracious purpose for us than when there are sunny skies. I mean, we, we prefer blue skies, but there are lessons and truths that can be only learned in the midst of a storm. And it's not... God's indifference, it's not his lack of care, it's not his lack of power, but his determination to conform us into the likeness of Christ that puts us on that ship and heads us out into the midst of the storm. Now all of this assumes, to close, that you are able to say with Paul of God, the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. The God to whom I belong speaks of Paul's identity. He belonged to God. He was God's possession. He's God's son. The God whom I serve, he's saying my identity determines how I live. I am his. It's he that I serve. Those things only come from through, through faith. 
if you have not placed your faith in Christ, I cannot make any of these assurances to you. For you stand apart from the God who stills the waves. You're running away from the, the Christ who walks upon the water, who says to the waves, thus far and no further. You're not confessing the God who splits the clouds and brings the sun shining down in the midst of any situation. Remember what God said to Job's friends, my anger burns against you. But you know what he says next? He then says to them, my servant Job will pray for you. And that's what we do here as a church. If you do not believe, we pray for you. And that's what I'm going to do now. So let's close. Let's pray.